that uh, we think maybe it will be not so much to discuss in our um, presentations. Uh, first presentation is from myself and uh, my very um, uh, uh, fabulous colleague from Georgia, Nanuli Tswediani. She is a librarian and archivist from Georgia. And uh, the reason why she's here is that the whole material I, we um, um, used for our presentation was collected in the uh, last about 20, 25 years by uh, Nanuli Tswediani. So, um, uh, the presentation, uh, our presentation is about cryptolect of Merkans uh, with special focus of uh, Georgian Jewish. And I wanted to show you this picture because um, it shows the marketplace from earlier 13th, we think, of last century in West Georgia in Kutaisi. We think that the most of material was uh, collected in uh, different sources. Um, pictured a little bit the, the communication or conversation because this part of Kutaisi is a Jewish district of district of Georgian Jewish in, uh, in West Georgia. So just for, for um, image, what is it about? Um, and from perspective of linguistic, the Silk Road uh, can be uh, recognized as a specific space of language contact. When we see some uh, international or uh, the contacts between, uh, for different reasons, uh, between nations, the first we think is, okay, we, we have some kind of language event contact and uh, depends on the, uh, the period of this contact and depends on the intensity and geography of this contact. It can be very interesting for different theoretical analysis uh, and um, methodical approach. Um, the Silk Road in context of the language in its all form of use can be understood as language in the service of uh, global trade. The traders have a necessity to communicate uh, to the address uh, the essential information more precisely. And they develop a specific language, or to say it more accurately, specific use of language. And this, uh, they um, I mean, this specific use represents a professional competence. And this competence was acquired, passed it on, with other professional knowledge. How I sell the things, how I buy the things, and so on and so on. On the Silk Road, not only the goods uh, were transported, but also words, idioms, expressions, and also the speech acts in sense of uh, interaction. Like communicational interaction as whole cultural event. And the Americans uh, self as homogeneous professional group and from perspective of uh, linguistic can be recognized as a kind of language assistance of, of in, this, in this context as language uh, in context of language contact. We have different um, examples in the history which can be uh, labeled as, uh, um, how can I say, the specific mercantile languages. Crypto or not crypto, but specific professional mercantile languages. The, in both register of use of language, in written register and spoken register, and here are just uh, some examples. For example, the Yemeni, there's a spoken one, the Yemenese businessman Argot, uh, I don't discuss in this presentation the terminology. So crypto language, crypto lect, argot, argo, dialect, and so on. That's the uh, other part, and uh, for 20 minutes, maybe too much. And uh, a very interesting article from Geoffrey Kahn from Zoas in London about goldsmith in Cairo. Very interesting uh, description of communication between gold sellers in Cairo is based on uh, Jewish but uh, the grammar is Arabic, and, uh, but also the Jewish natives can understand it, uh, the language. It's very interesting. It's a something what we think is a similar to our case of Georgian Jewish. And the horse and castle trader so social act is also one of the um, uh, terms in this uh, hierarchy. Also the ethno social act is sometimes used. Related to other Yiddish influenced argots such as Red Welsh, Rotwelsch, Yenish, or Mazemate. So in the Rotwelsch, I think in the German is uh, as a street slang, um, very, um, very well known. 
And examples for written mercantile languages, um, I underline uh, hidden or not hidden, uh, crypto or not crypto, but specific mercantile languages. It is speaking mercant secret alphabet in uh, 17th century Prague, for example. There are a lot of uh, examples for this secret alphabet. And Italian uh, traders style, not alphabet, but style of handwriting. Right, the same alphabet, but uh, style of hand style of calligraphy was only accessible for a specific group, homogeneous group of uh, mercants. Uh, um, Marcantesca is the name of it. Um, the complete, in completely different languages, we find the same forms and uh, similar aims of the use. So we it's very very similar function. Um, very similar global and practical pra function of use the language that corresponds uh, uh, to the economic and ecology, economical and social ecology uh, of Silk Road. That's uh, some, the point uh, must be maybe argumented deeper. Uh, when the linguists speak about language contact, uh, the first they think about is uh, the treatment with codes the different treatment with codes. So if you have a two languages in this context, so sometimes you have a cases in which the people switch from one language to other language. If behind of this switching is intention, if the switching is intentional, and as a rule, the linguist is described as a code switch. It is unintentional, it's a little bit automatically sometimes, we say that's code mix. But the catalog of this uh, terminology is quite long, language crossing, dialect crossing, and so on and so on. Um, and I just start with this um, assumption because in the many um, um, research and the many uh, monographies, you find this uh, terminology as a ground terminology for explaining this phenomenon. I think about uh, ship English, for example, maritime communication uh, based on English and uh, on the sea uh, Silk Road, the uh, 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 Seidenstrasse des Meeren. Yeah? And this is also the very specific conversation based on English. Uh, and this case can be descri uh, uh, described as a code switch uh, because this is intentional switch from one language to other language. Uh, I just start with this um, uh, terminological frame uh, to, to that case we'll, I will describe now, but I will criticize this and try to argue in other direction. The Georgia, one of the countries on the Silk Road and the north route of the Silk Road has a long tradition of trade. This tradition gave rise a professional dominated uh, by Georgian Jews who had been compactly settling in Georgian since 6th century BC. Um, and these segments, we recognize also the areas of language contact and uh, first, uh, the, the contact will be indicated by uh, borrowing. And the Hebrew words can be found in various Georgianized borrowings. And the strongest uh, Hebrew borrowing are the vocabulary of the street slang, for example. And they are even partly understandable across languages because in other languages, for example, East European, for example, Russian, uh, Ukrainian, for example, same lexemes were often borrowed. Um, the laws were used as a means of identification to form of professional groups as well as criminal networks, for example. Um, how is the language situation and the language portrait of Georgian Jewish? As a rule, they are bilingual, bilingual, as other Georgian as well, they are, so in the current uh, situation. Because, uh, and I wrote here the languages, so the Georgian as a first language and the Russian as a second language, but no competence in fluent Hebrew or Yiddish. Um, we implement a Volkswagen Stiftung um, a project um, six years long, about 10 years ago, about, about the linguistic portrait of Georgia. And we um, 
all the settlements of Georgian Jews uh, showed this picture. So bilingualism, at least with Georgian and Russian, but no fluent competence in Yiddish and, uh, or Hebrew. And, uh, but uh, the, we, uh, in Georgian dialectology and in Georgian language, uh, linguistic, uh, the Georgian Jews will be recognized in kind of subgroup with own ethno dialect or ethno social act. And this, why not, you know, the completely dialect? Because there are some um, lexical uh, items which are different to standard Georgian and some phonetical um, issues which are untypically completely to, to Georgian, for example. I just put here the two examples. This word, genatsvale, um, is kind of um, a surrogate for ethnonym. So you can say Georgia, here's coming one Georgia, you can say well, here's coming genatsvale. So the same, we are now in Hessen here, if you say, oh, here's coming one Gude. So Gude is a kind of, say hello in Hessen, so ident linguistically identificational uh, issue. Uh, if, I don't know if you're in Bavaria and you say Mia Zamia, it's like, like I am from Bavaria. If you say not Guten Tag, but you say Gude, you manifest, okay, I am local patriot or I am from, uh, from uh, um, Hessen, something like this. When I heard, for example, Die Verfahrengals in German, Spocht. So I think, okay, it's in North Germany. And this word it, uh, acts for whole Georgian uh, nation as a kind of ethnonym yeah? around of Georgia. It's like um, Otto Normalverbraucher or Johnny Sixpack, or Vanka Stankov, or I don't know. So it's the same thing. And there is no translation. So I, I, I try to translate Genatswal. It's kind of Shenich Ideme. When it comes to trouble, let me take your place. Genatswal. <laughs> yeah? So I take your place if you are in trouble. So let me do that. So some kind of, yeah? And the Georgian used this word where it's a very high frequent used lexem. And uh, many, many not Georgian, recognized Georgian, identified, identified Georgian with this word. And the only one modification of this word it can be found is in Judeo Georgian, Dagenatsle. You know, you know, the ethnologist, this is nothing, not big deal, but for linguists, this is really big deal together from Genatsle, Dagenatsle, because we have here, um, if I may, um, so this is a uh, um, spelling. This is the stem with the replace, and this is the pre-verb. This is the confix uh, together, and this is an attempt marker. So this is very rigid morphological structure of Georgian. In the every in every Georgian dialect, it will be used only in this way, and the, only the Georgian Jewish. Uh, replace this by other uh, preverb. Um, it's a zero, something like this. This stem it doesn't exist in Georgian, so this is kind of modification, but two with same function to identify himself as Georgian Jewish, right? And uh, the long vowel, for example, that, uh, in, uh, we have no uh, long and uh, short vowels in Georgian language. It's just the short vowels and that's it. And we have a long vowel, final vowel. For example, if the Jewish, Georgian Jews, if in Georgian we say genatsvale, so downstep. You don't hear this E, genatsvale. But here we have kind of melodical long E, da genatsvale, <laughs> so upstep. It's tot totally untypical for any Georgian dialect and for standard Georgian as well. So just about a little bit a portrait of uh, Jewish, Georgian Jewish um, in uh, Georgia. Some data, maybe it, um, historical data about uh, Georgian, um, about empirical data. Uh, we, uh, our analysis is based on approximately 170 uh, lexical forms that appears in various texts from field research but also uh, field research description. The oldest language documentation comes from the th uh, 13th of the last century, and the latest data were recorded as part of Volkswagen-sponsored uh, project, the linguistic portrait of, of Georgia. 
already in the 17th century, the Catholic missionaries in uh, Georgia um, described the Jewish district in Georgian cities. Um, in Kutaisi, where our data are from, there are two relatively big synagogues and from and form the outer markers of uh, Jewish district there. The, in the Soviet period, this district was known for the fact that one could buy there under the table the goods from West. For example, what for example, jeans trousers, for example, or sunglasses from capitalistic West in Soviet time. It was very uh, um, was known for, for uh, all possibilities to buy the things there you cannot get in normal shops, for example. This activity was forbidden in Soviet Union. There was even a special police department that fought it, economic crime, crime police department. The Jewish merchants, and now comes, the Jewish merchants has two practical uh, restrictions on communication. They should communicate with each other in such a way that police informer or spy or secret informer could not make statements against them. One thing. And the second thing, customers should be kept largely excluded from communication. Two things. Presumably, this specific situation uh, favored the revival and uh, maintenance of the old secret language of the traders or dealers. Um, which corresponded to both uh, restrictions. I would like you to mm, I would like you two examples from this conversation, and uh, I see in uh, here uh, at least one Georgian native speaker, Rusudan. I will ask you just with me to read this sentence and answer if you understand it. Dres tobat visochare magram saperi armie shamda da kelebma shochadi tsamartva. Would you say it is Georgian? No. It is not Georgian. But would you say you understand nothing in there? Um, I try to guess. What is it? So if two people in Georgian and you communicate to each other with this sentence, would you understand what they say? No. You will not understand what they say. That's the same experience I done and also. Uh, so I will show you, I just tried to separate in by color. Uh, a green is Georgian and the red is uh, Hebrew, Hebrew based. Uh, dress is just today, the Georgian word, it's a, a time adverb. And the uh, tobat is just well, it's uh, adjective. Visochare, it's two versions, socher, uh, just I deal or I trade something. Yiddish soch, affair or mother or event or something. It sounds like Russian word sukhari, uh, burnt uh, dry bread, right? And the sometimes in the street slang you see gava sukhari. And when you ask, what are you done? So I, I, I sell it and I make big uh, profit from it. Yeah? But it's just, uh, you know, the naive interpretation. The, uh, the real stem is gava sukhari. Magram is just a, a but, so... Um, um, Complementizer. Seperi is a uh, Jewish, uh, J uh, Jewish word, and the R is just negation of particle. Mieshamda. And we see here, Mieshamda. Uh, yeah, Visochare und Mieshamda. So this word and this word, they are verbs. And, and the linguistic is this really big question how the languages um, borrow the verbs. This is the most of difficult thing to borrow from one language to other language, the verb. It depends on uh, measurability of morphology of giver and the taker language, uh, but uh, based on rich Georgian morphology, you can make from every word, every part of speech. You can make from known a verb and from known the verb, uh, uh, verb the known. So, and we have here this very interesting form and mieshamda and kelebma. It's also this is just conjunction and kelebma uh, sochad. This is the once Georgian. Uh, really um, Georgian verb you can um, uh, interpret. The next, um, now I, I try to analyze these examples here. You see with the red only the uh, Jewish part of this word and uh, grammatical information coded in uh, 
uh, morphological markers of, uh, from Georgian grammar. So what we have is just a mix maybe of uh, one side of the grammatical information based of Georgian grammar, but the stems are, that's the reason why Russo doesn't understand it, because the semantic is, uh, of this sentence is hidden, but uh, syntax is the Georgian. So um, the next uh, maybe very interesting question, I have it from uh, uh, Nanuli. Shens mamons me miv khridi da rasats movugadoleb sava hezo ihos. do you understand it? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, just imagine uh, we try, uh, we, we both try to sell the goods from Suzanne, but we don't want that Suzanne understand how we uh, share the profit. So that's the sentence we need for that. And it doesn't matter if Susan is there or not. So that's why we think that this is a crypto. That's why we think that this is a hidden language. And uh, um, I, can, I can send you my message. I can send you what, what I, my strategy of selling. And it doesn't matter the uh, customer is there. There is not, we have, I separate also by color here, um, the Georgian and the Jewish parts of it. Um, so the same thing, like in the first example here. Um, yeah, yeah, as, and we have about 100, yes, we have about two minutes. We have about 170 list of the words we collect and they uh, uh, seems like this, for example, um, Rustan, uh, no. <laughs> again, you, Dav Lai Love Dead, Lai Lai. When you hear the Lai Lai, it's kind of, Blah, blah, blah. But in, uh, in the Jewish, it is just uh, overnight or to, to have a quarter in some uh, um, uh, place or something like It's very interesting uh, stamps we find in this communication. So uh, the thing is that um, if you look at the examples um, in general, um, then you look for description approach in the already mentioned terms like code switch and code mix. Uh, but if you take a, a closer look, you will uh, notice that with the crypto language of Georgian Jewish traders, there cannot be code switch or code mix. Why? Because for the code switch, the speakers usually have to be bilingual to switch from one language to other language. And the Georgian Jews are bilingual with Georgian as a first language, as I mentioned, and the Russian as second language. Within the crypto com conversation, however, Georgian and Hebrew are combined to each other, whereby the speakers have no competence in fluent Hebrew. That's the thing. Um, the combination of Hebrew and Georgian as a crypto, and no fluent uh, competence there. If the Georgians uh, switch to Russian, and from Russian to Georgian, that can be uh, um, a code switch because the speakers have a fluent competence in both languages. Hebrew will be only used to produce the cryptolect. So that's the distinction between code switch and producing of a cryptolect in our eyes. For future uh, research, uh, might be interesting the follow questions. Um, investigation for all varieties of mercant languages along Silk Road, at least in um, Cairo and at least in um, Damascus, there are uh, similar phenomena like this, uh, described by Jeffrey, Jeffrey Kahn. Investigation of all variation of professional languages involved in the functioning of Silk Road. I know a lot of professional languages, for example, in Iran, and also in Caucasia, in Armenia, or in South Azerbaijan. And comparative analysis of trading languages and the uh, border context of the economic and social ecology of the Silk Road. To put these three things, so the trader conversation, professional conversation, and all this along the Silk Road in a geographical area. It can be a very interesting field of research. Thank you very much. Thank you.